Hey, all you Chem 40 Meisters out there, 40S and 40H, it is Dr. Carroll here. It is Thursday, March the 26, 2020, and we are beginning the new unit, Unit 4 Equilibrium. Remember, tonight by 5 o'clock, your turnip booklet quiz from Unit 3 Kinetics is due, and I will also, perhaps even early tonight, will drop the test number three. I'm not going to drop it, that you can't do it. Dropping, I'm using the lingo of the musicians. It will be available for you, and that'll be due on Monday, April the 6th, 2020. So that's it for the kinetics discussion right now. Let's talk about equilibrium, and uh, you want to look at your hard copy booklet, Unit 4. If you don't have that, remember it's on our website. You can download it, tinyurl.com slash vmchem. It might say 1819, but it's the same information, 1819 as 1920. Okay, so uh, before we get into the big deal about equilibrium, which I'm going to abbreviate EQM, let me just take a pencil here. There we go, EQM, because equilibrium is lots to spell. If I always write that out, E-Q-U-I-L-I-B-R-I-U-M, that's a lot to write, so we do the abbreviation EQM. And some of you in physics already know about static equilibrium, where uh, in static equilibrium all the forces balance out and you get no uh, net force, but we aren't talking about static equilibrium here, we're talking about dynamic equilibrium, which we'll get to before, however, we're going to look at a preamble to give some motivation for equilibrium, and we're going to look at a few words that you may not have heard in the contexts that where I'm going to use them. The first is spontaneity, there's my little uh, circle there, so I'm circling the word spontaneity. Now you think of a spontaneous personality, like someone who does just something like on the on the spur of the moment, right? Like I remember when I was a kid, we walked once past an A&W, and this is when you would drive your car in, and the waitress or waiter, the server, would give you the food on a tray. Well, once we went to it, and in the stall for the car, we just sat and pretended we had a car, and it didn't take much thinking for that, and that was a spontaneous process, right, spontaneity. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a very specific chemistry example. Let's say you have two reactants, A plus B, going to form C plus D. That double arrow there is called an equilibrium arrow we'll get to in a second. If the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, that means going from left to right, then it's going to proceed as written without continual outside intervention. It just keeps going and going till there's no more reactant left. We say it's product favorite, or hardly any reactant left if it's really spontaneous. So a nuclear explosion is something that once it gets started, once you get that activation energy going, it just keeps going until there's essentially no uranium or plutonium left. Resting, right? I drove an old 1991 Chevy Cavalier for like 45 years, and it rested completely out, right? That is just a spontaneous process the reaction keeps on going, the iron in your uh, car will react to the oxygen and the salt and acid rain and water, all this stuff, speeding up the resting. And you don't have to do much, it spontaneously happens. If you want to prevent the resting, well then you got to do a lot. Then you got to keep going to the chamois every four hours and putting on rest inhibitors and spending all your money trying to keep your car from resting. Aging is another spontaneous process. I don't have to do anything and I get older. Lately I've been getting older really fast, okay? So we can try to slow the aging process by buying skin creams and drinking smoothies and all this other stuff, but bottom line is we're going to keep on aging. So that is a spontaneous process. If a reaction is non-spontaneous, then it's said to be reactant favored. So in other words, the reaction is spontaneous in the reverse direction. In general, spontaneous processes occur because of two things. You want to become energetically more stable and you want to become more disordered. So here's a word you might not have heard before. Entropy. E e -N there we go. E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. And given the letter S. We've heard of enthalpy, which is an H. Well, now we have entropy, which is an S. So just think of it. Uh, so far in science, you've heard of the words energy, 
enthalpy, and now entropy. Okay, those are all related, but still somewhat different. So entropy is a measure of disorder in a system. As the entropy increases, the disorder increases. And so let's look at a few uh, examples of entropy. And it's a really interesting thing. The whole second law of thermodynamics depends on entropy. First of all, a gas is going to ha be more disordered than a liquid, more disordered than a solid. Okay, because think of a mole of water molecules. If they're frozen in time, frozen in ice, then they're um, going to have more order. It's like a marching band with the band in a still formation. So they aren't marching yet, they're just practicing in line. Then when they get a bit groovier, they start moving around more, getting a bit more disordered, and then it's, then it's liquid. And then if you put on like Rush or Motley Crue or Pearl Jam or one of these, then they're just moshing around, uh, Slipknot, whatever you got, and that's gas phase. So that is total, complete disorder, right? So the gas phase molecules in a sample of water are going to have a greater disorder. So their entropy value is larger than a liquid and in turn larger than in a solid. And as the temperature within any one of those phases goes up, then the entropy increases as well. There's more disorder. So if you've got that marching band, then they're just raising their knees a little bit. Yeah, that's some disorders. But if you get some really rock and tune going, and they're like raising their knees a lot, and their arms playing the tuba or whatever the heck they're playing, then that is more disorder. Another example here is a complex molecule is more disordered than a simple molecule. If you have a molecule of H2O, let me just squeeze it in here, H2O, so you're going to have the bonds vibrating and, and, and at the same rate, uh, opposing each other, symmetric stretches, asymmetric stretches, rotating, things like that. That's You're going to say, water is a pretty simple molecule. Well, not if you compare it to hydrogen, just H2, right? H2, you just got it's tumbling about, but there's really no centered ant atom there, is there? And the uh, disorder, therefore, is going to be less. Yeah, there is the oscillations of the bond itself, but the water is more disordered than the uh, hydrogen molecule. So at the same temperature, water will have more disorder than hydrogen. Um, you can talk here, I snuck this one here, a solution is more disordered than the solute and the solvent together. So if I have a sugar cube and a glass of water separate, that is more ordered than if I then dissolve the sugar cube in the water because now you're getting the intermingling of the sucrose molecules with the water molecules. So just like if you're making a tossed salad and you got like separate rows of carrots, onions, lettuce, celery, that is more ordered than when you just throw them all into the big bowl and mix them up and make your salad. Okay, now I'm getting hungry. Um, an interesting uh, little sidebar to this is what we have the second law of thermodynamics. You may wonder, well, what's the first law of thermodynamics? There is no fight club, no. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy is conserved so it's involving work and heat and we don't really talk about that concept much in this course you will more in physics second law deals with entropy says that if you have a spontaneous reaction then the uh, entropy of the universe the universe being the systems and the surroundings is greater than zero okay so here uh, we have someone on a ski hill and they're Get a little push. Someone pushes that person. Oh, let's give them a little toque, maybe. There you go. And some sunglasses. And they will naturally, hey, that's not bad, they will naturally go down the hill to the bottom. And they may end up at the bottom all disheveled. And, uh, ooh, that didn't look good with their arm, did it? And there's your ski poles all over the place. So they're all dissembled and disordered at the bottom, right? And, uh, they naturally, the skier goes down the hill, so the enthalpy decreases, right? If you want to think of potential energy profiles from unit three, further 
the entropy increases because the person's all uh, more disordered than at the top. Now you may say, oh well, what if the person tries really, really hard to land nicely without falling on their face? Uh, well, yeah, the thing is, though, when you're working, you sweat, right? And when you sweat, you perspire, you're converting liquid to gas, and gas has a greater entropy than liquid. So the surroundings may increase in disorder, even if the system doesn't. And the sum total is that the spontaneous process, the uh, universe is increasing in uh, in, in, in disorder. So, uh, and in fact, literally, our universe itself is still expanding, and that is a spontaneous process, right? There's more places to put uh, stars and galaxies and all this other uh, cool things that they have in the sky, the Remax uh, balloon, for example, all that good stuff. So, um, what, I wanted to say something else about entropy that was interesting. Uh, Disorder in a system. Yeah, usually we try to get, like I said, the enthalpy decreasing and the entropy of a system increase. If both those happen, then you will go. You, then you're guaranteed a spontaneous process at all temperatures. If, however, let's say the enthalpy increases and the entropy increase, they both do the same thing, then it depends on temperature. If I have a glass of water and have it uncovered, with time, the water molecules are going to evaporate. Okay, so you're going to go from liquid to a gas, so that's going to be disorder, whereas the enthalpy increases because you are having an endothermic process. So it will be spontaneous, but only above zero degrees Celsius. If you're lower than zero degrees, then you're not going to get evaporation because then you have ice, not liquid. So we could go on and on about entropy, but there's other things to do. But it is interesting, and uh, you should certainly watch a video one day down the line about entropy. And, you know, you can say, let's say your room's really messy, and your uh, mom, dad, caregiver, sibling says, hey, uh, Billy, will you clean up your room and you say no I don't have to because the second law of thermodynamics says it's just going to get messy again right I always try at the beginning of every year to have all my like binders uh, labeled and all that but then there's always I'm sharing rooms with 400 other teachers and they're always encroaching on my space and everything gets all messy even if I don't do anything so and they always take all my pens I don't like that okay so uh, let's keep going here and, of course, pause at any time if you want to look at some stuff again. Um, so let's get into equilibrium here. Dynamic equilibrium. That's when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. And I just did something weird. There we go. Okay, okay. Here we go. I don't need those colors anymore. Um, I've got more tablets going on here than a pharmacy, I tell you. Okay, um, rate of forward equals the rate of reverse. See, when molecules smash together to go from reactant to product, those products start smashing together. and There can be effective collisions, which can shoot the products back to the reactant side. And that's, kids don't like that. They say, no, no, products are produced. What are you talking about? Products are going to form something? No, they're produced. Well, get used to it, okay? We also like to just talk about the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So let's say we have a saturated sugar solution. In grade 11 chemistry, you talked about solubility and uh, saturated. Saturated means you're at equilibrium. You dissolve some sugar. It keeps dissolving nicely. It's unsaturated for a while until one crystal can't dissolve anymore. Then it's saturated. Okay? You've created an equilibrium system, which means the rate of solvation, and solvation means just dissolving. Uh, it's also called dissolution. When that equals the rate of crystallization, when those rates are the same, you have achieved dynamic equilibrium. Nothing stops. Molecules keep moving. Things get exchanged between phases. There's a physical process, the sugar solution one. But uh, it is at equilibrium. The concentration of the sugar stays constant. It's not always the same sugar molecule, but the concentration stays constant. So that is one example of... Uh, dynamic equilibrium. Now let's look at another one here. 
we have here uh, example two. A little asterisk there to show where I am. At constant pressure, we have uh, a closed system. So we got liquid water in a flask. And then above the liquid, there is going to be some water vapor. Some of those liquid molecules on the surface are going to pop up. They can't leave, though. So, uh, and some in the vapor phase are going to fall down. So you end up with a dynamic equilibrium. The rate at which the liquid water vaporizes is the same as which the uh, gas condenses. So when those are the same, we have another example of dynamic equilibrium. And you can come up with other ones uh, as you see fit. Uh, if you want for fun, not for an extra mark, but just for fun, send me on Edsby an example of equilibrium, an analogy that you can come up with. Uh, sometimes sports analogies are good, or restaurants, or parking lots, something like that. Okay? Now, chemical equilibrium is when we're going to get new molecules forming. And uh, so you need a chemical change. You have to have a closed system. Again, if it's open, then you're just going to lose stuff and you can't get to equilibrium. Must be reversible. That means you can start just with stuff on the left-hand side and end up with stuff on both sides, or just stuff on the right-hand side and end up with stuff on both sides, or a little bit of everything, a little bit of stuff on the left-hand side and right-hand side, and then they go in a certain direction, which we'll get to that to... Um, get to equilibrium. So at equilibrium we have to have at least a little bit of all species present and at equilibrium the concentrations of all species stay constant with respect to time. So as time goes by the concentrations no longer change. Some students think that the concentrations of all the reactants have to equal the concentrations of all the products. No that's not true. Just every uh, system, every species, every reactant Concentration can no longer change with time. Every product concentration can no longer change with time. So let's look at this case here where I have um, SO2 plus O2 goes to SO3. And we have what's called an ice diagram. It has nothing to do with ice. It just stands for initial change and equilibrium. So the initial concentration, we use those little square brackets. A little O for original or I for initial is fine, the original great. Then the change is the little delta, and then the equilibrium. And then you see up here your change is the equilibrium minus the initial, so your equilibrium is the initial plus the change. So suppose I just uh, made up some numbers here. Let's say I had 10 moles of SO2 to begin with, 6 moles of O2, and no moles of SO3. Then let's say I lost, oh, I don't know, a bit of SO2, let's say 3. Well, then the O2, I'd have to lose half of that, so one and a half, right, to maintain a two to one ratio. And the SO3 that I would form would be three. So that's a one to one ratio. So at equilibrium, I have seven moles per liter of SO2, four and a half moles per liter of O2, and three moles per liter of SO3. My dogs really enjoyed that example. They saw some dog walk past the window and barked. That woke some of you up, didn't it? Um, what's that? Yeah, same time, same rate. So that's equilibrium. Here you could graph. I'm on page three here. You could have a graph of concentration versus time. So you could say, oh, SO2 and O2 are going down for a while. Then they plateau, whereas SO3 goes up and then plateaus. Now, I didn't put any numbers here. I just want you to get the general idea that once you get to equilibrium, whenever that is, the curves all plateau. They are Plateau means they're all horizontal. They all become constant functions if you want to get really fancy about it. Right? So the SO2 and O2 go down. They don't go down to zero though because once the SO3 is formed it goes up for a while but then SO3s hit other SO3s and uh, go back to SO2. In case two, let's say we don't start with any SO2 or O2 and just SO3. So you're going to gain some SO2, you're going to gain some O2, you're going to lose some SO3. So at equilibrium, we're going to have SO3 goes down but doesn't go to zero. zero. It levels off. SO2 goes up and levels off. O2 goes up and levels off. 
Then case three, I could have a little bit of everything to start with, and we'll get to that shortly. How do you observe equilibrium? Well, if you can get one of these graphs and see things level off, that's one way. Another way is, before doing graphs, just the color intensity. Let's say SO3 was, or let's say SO2 was dark brown and O2 was colorless, and then SO3, got, you got lighter and lighter brown, and when the intensity no longer changes, that's a signal that, oh, we're at equilibrium pH, cell voltage, radioactivity, vapor pressures. There's other ways to determine when you get to equilibrium. We're going to focus mostly on the graphs. And, um, well, let's just... Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a good place to stop for there. So that's our first lesson, the first three pages. Uh, take a look at it and uh, have fun with it. Okay, I'm going to stop this for now.